Welcome to episode 267 of CXO Talk. What an amazing show we have today. Did you know that Comcast, the cable provider, is one of the largest media companies in the world? Their revenues last year were like $80 billion. And so today we are speaking with, Com with Chris Satchel, who is Comcast's executive vice president and chief product officer. But not only that, we are also talking with one of the top digital transformation focused industry analysts in the world, Brian Solis. I'm Michael Krigsman. I'm an industry analyst and the host of CXO Talk. I want to say a quick thank you to Livestream because Livestream provides our video infrastructure. And those guys supported CXO Talk from the start. And if you go, go to livestream.com slash CXO Talk, they will give you a discount on their plans. So without further ado, oh, and I need to, you know, I always forget this. We have a tweet chat going on at this very minute. You go to Twitter with the hashtag CXO Talk. And if you're on Facebook, go to Twitter also because that's where the conversation, and you can ask Chris and Brian questions and they'll answer. Without further ado, Chris Satchel, how are you? And uh, welcome to CXO Talk and thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me, Michael. No, it's, it's great to be here. It's great to have Brian here as well. Um, looking forward to this conversation. So, Chris, uh, very briefly, tell us about uh, Comcast and tell us what you, what your role, what your chief product officer. What is, what does that actually mean? What do you do there? Well, I, you teed Comcast up well. I mean, it is a, a very large U.S. company, eighty billion dollars in revenue in twenty sixteen. Been growing well this year, and it's quite a complex company because on the cable side, you know, we have the world's biggest IP network. We are almost in 30 million households with products from like high-speed data and smart, intelligent Wi-Fi to uh, home, branded home security and life preservation services to smart cameras. And then we have voice services um, and, of course, video. And we, we do a huge amount of video services. We also have a very large and growing business-to-business um, -business side of what we do. Um, not as big as residential, but it's, it's, a, it's a huge business in its own right. And then, of course, we have the other half of the company with NBC Universal, which is incredible in, in the realm of you know, content production, whether it's for network television, for cable, for films, or theme parks. And so a very broad media company. Um, my role's a little strange. It says chief product officer, but I come traditionally uh, to companies as a chief technology officer. I'm just very sort of creative focused in that. And so what my teams do is we design, we build, we operate all of the consumer facing products and services uh, for Comcast. So, you know, that's everything from hardware, from the sort of SOC design on up, um, industrial design, firmware, to services like X1, which is our contemporary video service. And we do, we do the back end cloud services for that as well as the clients across any platform. And so we're a, a fully integrated design product management and engineering organization it spans about 2,000 people and that's that's just my area that does consumer products we're a much larger engineering and technology organization and there's something people don't really realize about us we are a hardcore technology product development company um, very forward-leaning and hopefully we'll get to talk about some of those things today fantastic well you're a very rich uh, very rich diverse company with a lot of uh, different products I am, I'm a Comcast, I'm a very happy Comcast customer. When it comes to internet, you know, I do this, I stream this video show called CXO Talk, and uh, I have your gigabit service, and the, the technology is great, and it works really well. That's fantastic to hear. <laughs> so our co-host, the other guest, and also uh, my guest co-host, uh, old buddy, who has been on CXO Talk before, is... Brian Solis. And Brian, you're one of the top top people out there researching digital transformation. And welcome. And what are you working on these days? Well, it is uh, an absolute pleasure to be back. And also, Chris, Chris and I are uh, old-time friends and also old friends, I guess, if we want to get technical about it. But uh, we share a love uh, for very, very many things outside of innovation and work. So it's, a, it's really fun to be here. Uh, you know, what, am I, what I'm working on is 
there's three things that I'm, I'm focused on, and one is digital transformation. The other is innovation, corporate innovation, because they go hand in hand. Uh, actually, four things. Third is this idea of customer and employee experience, because it gives the first two uh, innovation and digital transformation purpose. And then lastly, the thing that seems to be, uh, you know, if you put a Venn diagram right there at the center is corporate culture. Uh, and that is really either a catalyst or the greatest inhibitor of all of the above. Uh, and I'm really trying to get not just the technology side of all of these things, but the human side of it. I just published a report this week, actually, called the Change Agents Manifesto, which was written for folks like Chris to help them basically change mindsets and perspectives of the C-suite and boards to help them understand that all of these things aren't cost centers and that we have to look broader than quarter to quarter performance that we have to look for the long term to compete for the future. So change and transformation. Comcast has been in business, Chris, for what, 50, almost 55 years, roughly. And I have to imagine that in the course of those 55 years, Comcast has gone through various types of changes. And so, so how do you think about and, and you're, a te- you're a technology business, so how do you think about what Brian was just saying? You know, transformation and the cultural dimensions and change, and how do you, how do you manage that? How do you think about that? Well, first thing I'll say is I think we did less continuous delivery 50 years ago than we do now. Um, that seems likely. A little bit before my time. Um, but I fully agree with Brian. I mean, Brian and I, we, we, one of the reasons that we became friends is we see eye to eye on so many things about the consumer journey and how you have to enable that. And I fully agree, it, culture and people are the key of any technology transformation, I mean any transformation, but especially technology transformations. Um, and one of the things I always think about, and I talk to people about this, is in my whole career, I've only actually ever seen two projects go off the rails because of sheer technology. Uh, and your know, technology is just too hard to overcome. I mean, it's just limitations at that point in history where you, you just couldn't get past it. Every other issue it has been about people. And so for me, technology is inherently a people issue, and that's, that's how we approach it. You have to get the culture right. You have to get the context right. You have to get the team right. You have to get direction right. Then you can drive change and accelerate it. And you have to get the right platform. As we talk about enabling change, enabling innovation, it's fine to have great intentions, but if all your platforms and systems and the connectivity between them and the tools you have to get ideas into those platforms, if they aren't in place and if they aren't designed around velocity, you're not going to be as fast as you need to be in this world. And, and so although you have to have all, everything else, and what I say about it is that a great team will overcome anything. But if you can take a great team, give them the context, including the tools to do great work, they will accelerate and they will outstrip anything you thought they might be able to do. Brian, I know you have comments on this. There's a part of Chris's story that I would love to be shared with everyone. Uh, you know, I wrote a book a couple of years ago uh, called X, The Experience Where Business Meets Design. It was really about how to think differently about innovation and by taking a step back and thinking about design for a new generation of customers and employees that really are not in alignment with today's corporate policies, processes, uh, even just how we think and and how we think about productization. And when I first met Chris, uh, he was a recent transplant from Nike to Comcast, and we shared an immediate uh, passion for design. And I wanted Chris to sort of tell us a bit about his background from Nike to Comcast and what he brought to the com- company that was unique. Well, as you said, it's um, you, we hit it off. I think part of the reason and and is it's about design and it's about designing the entire journey. And I think that's something that we we there's a couple of things we really focused on at Nike. One was this idea of consumer brand business. You know, do what's right for the customer first, then worry about the brand and the brand promise you'll make to the customer. Then worry about the business. And if you get the first two right, the third will come. And the second one was about thinking about the entire journey. And every touch point on that journey is an interaction with the customer. That can be positive or negative. So you can be building promoters all the way along or detractors all the way along. And you have to think very broad. And so you, know, you think way beyond when you've got a product installed or you've got it in your home. You have to think, how did I learn about it? How did I acquire it? How did I pay for it? How did it get to me? How did I install it? Or at Nike, we would think all the way to, you know, what is my interaction with uh, an in-store athlete that was serving me because that is a great connection point with the, with the, com- uh, with the company. And so 
every point along a journey is your brand and you have to be authentic and you have to serve the customer correctly there. So that's, you know, that's some of the things uh, we brought here. And then from my time at Xbox, again, it was a lot about delivering the very best experience and not settling and never being content with what you're providing, no matter how good it is, because you kind of have to think in this consumer world, no matter how good you think your experience is, there is somebody out there merrily raising the bar on you. It won't have to be in your sector. It doesn't have to be in your industry. I think as far as consumers are concerned, it's wherever they see the best experience, they now expect you, expect you to match it. Whether that would make business sense for you or not, that's just what consumers think now. And so that relentless drive forward to, to just be the very best, not sector, not business, not industry, but just the best is something that you know, I, I've, I brought here, but other people have brought it here as well. My, my directs, and, and they're amazing people, they all think, and the, those leaders think the same thing. And so we're always trying to push each other to think about how do we deliver a better product to the consumer? If Mike, if I could just ask one more question on that front, because that's a, that's a tremendous train of thought in that you, your work today and you know, your, your past work is really the future of what I think most organizations need to think about, because you hit on something that I think a lot of executives miss, and that is the consumer doesn't care about all of the politics and BS mm -hmm. that happen within the organization. They just want the experience to be personalized. They want it to be great. They want it to be intuitive, maybe, in, maybe transparent in many ways. But the thing that I, I really hope that people can learn from you and, and other organizations that are breaking new ground is that Innovation is as much about products as it is about policies and processes and how we even work as well. And I think the biggest thing is just shifting mindsets. I, you know, I, I look at today's, you know, I call them Generation C. They're not millennials. They're not centennials. They're not Generation X. They're just anybody who lives a digital lifestyle. Uh, and what they all share is this, this heightened bar for expectations and these new behaviors and these, they're impatient and all of these things that you know, for example, we talk about the Uberization or the consumerization of technology. You know, when, when someone uses Uber, that becomes their standard for, for engagement. When someone uses an Apple product, that's their standard or, or Google search. You know, this new level of experience is blurring the line for regardless of products or services that they want that same sort of intuition, that same sort of clarity and cleanliness throughout the entire journey. And yet organizations are built on these 50, 60-year-old structures that has all of those things apart. So how, how have, in your work, have you been able to go across functionally to bring these people together and see the light? Yeah, it's such a good point, Brian, because one way to say it is, if I'm a customer, I think my, my reaction is, you know, your org structure is not my problem. And we used to even talk about this back at Xbox about like trying to paper over the cracks in our org structure so that the consumer didn't see. And you'll see so many companies when you, when you track their product portfolio, it matches the org structure and you've got to fight so hard to take that mentality out. And you've got to find leaders who will be selfless and say, okay, yes, I have this release vehicle, but I'm going to take functionality from somewhere else, or I'm going to give up something in my release vehicle because it doesn't make sense to the customer. So one thing we do is we come customer in, and everybody says that, but we really think about like, what would the customer want to do? And that saw us remove a lot of apps from the app store. We really shrunk down our video apps. We've really consolidated. And it's also having a great understanding. We have a very strong user research function here. And you know, you just gotta be open to it. Because one of the things I've found is people say, we need research. And you show them research, and they're like, I don't agree with the research, so we're gonna carry on what we were doing. So why did I do all that research? And what we try to do is be, you know, as much as we can, be really sort of selfless about it and say, well, hey, what did the customer just tell us? Even if it's not what we wanted to hear, even if it's a different direction that our brilliant strategic minds came up with, this is what they said. So let's go follow that. And when you come customer in, you start, you start making different decisions. And then what you have to do is fight, fight, fight internally to cross organizations and then what, to, to make sure that you deliver the way the customer wants. One thing that I find really helpful is building that combined vision and strategy and constantly updating it to say, this is what our portfolio means for the consumer. Here's what we're doing for them. And resist talking about release vehicles in that and say, here's consumer problems we're going to solve. Here's opportunities to delight them. And then fill in how your portfolio should do that. And you start to get a different answer. You say, well, hey, we've always done this in this release vehicle here, this app, this product, this piece of hardware. That doesn't make any sense anymore. In this world we're defining, it should be somewhere else. And then you just have to deal with the politics of that. And it's, it's a constant pressure because people will regress into their SAP reporting structures. So 
it, it just takes a lot of um, political capital from all the leaders to keep doing the right thing for the customer. And if you do it enough, it becomes learned behavior, which is great. So now you start talking. Or well, one of the things that can help as I think about it is getting that common language. And so I'll give you a very strong example. We have amazing high-speed data services and we have great home security services. But really what the consumer thinks about is their digital home. They don't really care what the products are or the org structure. They, I have a digital home. I want to have automation in it. I want to have great ubiquitous Wi-Fi. I want it to be able to react to me. I want to have peace of mind around my home. None of that says you have to have a particular product structure. And so we changed the name. We said, look, we're now digital home. We're going to integrate the teams. We're going to think about it differently than just the vertical bit, uh, sort of vertical businesses we thought about before. So all this takes pressure. And the last thing I'll add in, because I think it speaks to the journey, is we did a product we released in May this year called XFi, and it's like our smart, intelligent, whole home Wi-Fi. One of the things I love, and I use this as an example internally about what the team did, they spent as much time developing all of the onboarding, from the onboarding the gateway, uh, setting up your network, that took as much development effort, as much design effort, as much product effort, as all the rest of the experience combined, all the different functions, all the different things it could do. And the idea is, well, you're not gonna do that often. You may do it once, a, you know, once every few years. You may do it a couple of times a year if you're moving. The key is, you wanted that moment of truth to be amazing. And I think that's something that we're trying to think about here is, like, not every app is a minutes of usage engagement app or visits per day engagement app. It's about were you there at the moment of truth and how good were you? And thinking about products that way is a great way to, uh, to really um, serve the customer. And, and my example of doing that is, you know, we sort of learned that from Nordstrom's, right? You take something back to Nordstrom's, it's an incredible experience. I don't spend my life taking garments back to Nordstrom's, but I'm glad when I do, it's fantastic and I remember that. Good to think in your products. Are you a moment of truth product? or your engagement product? And do you transition from one to the other or do you stay in that domain? I have a question for both of you. And by the way, uh, I was remiss in not pointing out that today is Brian Solis's birthday. And not only that, Brian just like hopped off a plane from India, ran home and jumped on this CXO talk. So Brian, happy birthday. And uh, <laughs> how in the world you, did you survive, you know, Happy India birthday, and then Brian, from but here. So like it's now he's said that like you look so much better than I do. It's disgusting. I was thinking it looks better than me too. <laughs> anyway, yeah. so here's here's my question, um, Chris. You were just describing an approach to product development, placing the consumer first, and that requires empathy. And you're a large organization, and Brian, you've been studying large organizations, uh, looking that looking at that that experience. So for people listening, how do you institutionalize, how can an organization institutionalize that kind of empathy perspective when surrounding everybody that works inside a company or is the press of spreadsheets and MBAs save two cents there. And if you do that, you can save five cents. But wait, but what about the customer? Save the five cents. So Brian, maybe start with you. How do you, how do you institutionalize that? Well, I have this uh, this joke that I, I I tried to be innovative once, but I got stuck in meetings all day. I mean, <laughs> the, the reality is that, uh, as Chris said, m much of this is is I hate to use the word, but it's so true. Political. I found that the five most common uh, hurdles in trying to institutionalize any of this are all human challenges. Things like fear, ego, sabotage, self preservation. Uh, so there's and actually there's more than five, but I had to try to categorize it in, in for a matter of simplicity. So it's a matter of juggling. Uh, in, in what Chris said were the nuances of it. You have to speak a common language. You have to bring people to the table in a, in a safe way. You have to show that there's greater return than just the, the inherent benefits of trying to be innovative or trying to be digitally transformed. And, and more so, you have to step out of your role uh, and realize that if you're waiting for someone to tell you what to do, you're on the wrong side of innovation. That these, these people, I call them change agents, but they, you know they go by many other names, is that they Change comes from the middle most of the time, and it's really helping people see that all of this, all of this change that's happening on the outside is actually for the betterment of everybody. It's just that we're dealing with folks that 
it, it, we're just coming down to change management issues, really. Uh, and I think if you can give change management a purpose where people can see that their work actually has impact on this front, uh, then you, you then you have a start. But uh, there is no easy answer to this. And Chris, you live it every day. So, I mean, maybe you have some more tangible things to share. Well, it's interesting you talk about, you know, we're a big company, but you know, often you look at my organization, we're still a pretty large organization. It really isn't like that. It's not one big organization. It's, you know, it's 40, 50, 60 um, squads with product management, with design, with development. And those product managers are encouraged to understand their customer, to look at the, the stats coming in on the products, to look at the research studies, to go out in the field and ride with our techs and see what happens with the customer, to listen to calls through our call centers. So there's lots of ways to, to, to do those touch points that can keep those teams really focused on their area. But I think the other thing you have to do is leadership. And you, know, you need to get those people covered. When I talk about sort of a context that allows people to be successful, it's about that. You know, so what we try to encourage the product managers and their dev teams is, you know, don't worry about the business yet. Like maybe there are key, key business requirements we have to take on board as we think about a product, but don't worry about how it monetizes. Like don't worry about the, the cost. Do, let's build the right thing, come up with the right designs. And, and I think another one is to tell people not to censor themselves too early. And I've, I've been in sessions before where you're brainstorming something new and everybody's self-editing. They're like, well, I don't think the business would go for that. Oh, legal's going to tell us no. And, and what I, you know, I think one of the things can really help is you say, look, after we get out of this meeting, there is an entire world of people whose job are designed to tell you no, to cut down the idea, to, to make it tenable for all these different systems in your company. So don't, ed don't edit yourself. You've got a whole organization to do that for you. Let's start thinking great ideas and keep driving for them. And then I think what you need is leadership that knows when to really push and say, I understand what those business requirements are. They're wrong. We should spend more because it's going to, for the, if you look at the, so let me just pull, let me interrupt myself because what I found with a lot of disagreements between product and the business, it's not that if you talk about the very end goal with no timelines, you disagree. Like business people want to serve the customer as well. It's not like they're these evil people. They really want to give a great service as well. What happens is you're t you talk about two different timelines often. You'll say, hey, I want to do these great products. And you're thinking, hey, I'm going to deliver next year. And then two years after that, I've got this five-year roadmap for the product. Yeah, I know I'm going to have to change it because consumers change every year. But I've got these big ideas where well, the business might be thinking, I've got constraints this quarter. I've got constraints this half or this year. And so often you can agree on an endpoint, and then it's really about how do you prioritize in between. And so I think it's very good to make sure you're talking about time horizon. But then sometimes you just got to go back and say, I'm going to fight for the right thing for the customer, even if it looks like the wrong business right now, because if I look at the long-term value of the customer, this will pay dividends. You know, very, very infrequently does anybody get chastised in the long term by consumers for doing the right thing for consumers. And so you just got to be ready to fight for that. We have a couple of comments from Twitter. Uh, Shelly, a couple of questions. They're really the same question. Shelly Lucas and Arsalan Khan are both asking in different ways, how do you empower managers to make these kinds of decisions that you're describing to, to withstand the corporate pressures to do the right thing? How do you do that? So what we do is we set up processes that help them and I'll, I'll describe that in a moment. And also, it really is about the layers of leadership. You have to show those people that you have confidence in them. We let them define their features. We let them go and research it. We, you can test it with consumers, and we let them build it. And you know, one of the biggest sort of, sort of intellectual sets of hubris you can see from leadership is believing you always know the right answer. Because you're not as close to the problem often as the people that are building it. And so you have to be willing to say, you know what? That's not what I would have done. But what, what I would suggest you do is no better, it's just different. So let's go with your idea because you spent more time in research on it. So one is just, just giving people that protection. It's also that elevation. You know, and it's, it's that you know, when you say, hey, we've got an exec review, you can bring the people in that actually had the idea. Or it might be time when you don't bring them in because you're just going to defend their ideas and you're going to push back hard and you don't want an audience doing that. One of the things that we've done that's really helped empower the teams, and it's going to sound really boring, but it's so important, is we have this quarterly planning process. And it's how we take our annual goals for a portfolio and break it into quarters. So every quarter, what we do is the product managers 
they get with all their stakeholders, wherever they are, including you know, user research and what they want to do. And they write, they say, for my area, here's, here's a one-page spec of what I want to do. And it's something that can be achieved in a quarter for their, um, for their area, the product or their product. Then what, and it says, here's all the team's help I need. And what we do is we have this process where we stack rank them, and then we plan, and we just plan from top to bottom, making sure that any uh, higher priority thing, you know, it fills resources in first, so we don't get sort of like hanging, hanging Chad syndrome, common in development. You have an org of, you sort of, there's 2,000 people in my organization, and there's another 8,000 people we, we, we work with. So what you don't want to have happen is you start off on something, and then you find out one of the constituent teams can't, deal with the capacity constraints for that quarter and you can't deliver anything. So we solve that problem, but importantly, it gives all your partners somewhere to go. We, when they say mid-quarter, well, we'd like to go in this direction or we want to change what's happening, you say, great, talk to your product manager. They can, if they like the idea, they can bring it to the next planning. And it's a way that we have managed to kind of bring quarterly agility to annual planning. But what we do is we only schedule 50% of our capacity that way and we call it directed. We do 50% what we call trusted capacity, where we just say to the scrum teams, hey, work your backlog, put on your backlog what you know that you need, what the customer needs. That's your capacity to manage, go manage it. So we work very hard to carve off part of their capacity that they could just use to do the right thing. And you know, it's taken us almost a year and a half of constant effort to get that to work, but it really has helped us take you know, the 36 teams that were feeding into video and actually make them more agile and coordinate across them. So it's agile writ large at a very big scale. Brian, uh, we've just, Chris was just talking about uh, two different things in a sense. One is kind of the qualitative aspects of institutionalizing that empathy and focus on the customer. And then he, he was just alluding to more quantitative approaches in terms of process and, and structure. And the question that I have is, as you've been researching this, Brian, are there metrics, KPIs uh, that, that can help people think about Again, embedding this and in institutionalizing this 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 kind of way of thinking, customer centric thinking, and agile product development, and so forth. Yeah, you know, I think I'm going to uh, turn this into a two part question, where the or answer where the first part I'll answer, and then I'll defer to Chris to share what he can about some of the metrics that he's he's using. Because what I have noticed is in my research, this is directly tied to corporate culture. So the, how the company works, uh, the leadership infrastructure, the management infrastructure, it has to see and, and talk about things differently. Uh, it's just the nature of how the company works. So metrics, you, you still have your hard metrics that have to show ROI and KPIs that lead to that ROI. But to get there uh, is, is that's, that's the real story. Uh, and I'll tell you that in many cases, I found that change agents have found that not only does ROI stand for return on investment, it also stands for return on ignorance. What happens if we don't do this? What is that cost? What can we prove out that shows that these investments will yield this now and over time? And it's really trying to change people's perspectives and mindsets of what return actually looks like. And it opens their mind uh, because in many cases, executives don't know what they don't know. And I, you know, I, I want to believe you know, that Chris, Chris is right, that people want to do the right thing, that they're not, they're not evil in many ways. But the, the reality is, is that many executives actually just don't live the life the way or live the company the way that their customers and employees do. Uh, and so I used to call this the undercover boss moment. If you, if you ever watch that show, uh, of which <laughs> I love because it's, uh, it's always inspiring, but it has the same ending every episode. Uh, and that is when you put an executive in the shoes of an employer or a customer, they can't help but feel the empathy of what someone else has to go through on a day-to-day -day basis. And it opens their eyes to see what's possible. And we have right now such a distinct, such a distinct difference between how customers are evolving and employees are evolving and how executives are going day-to-day -day in terms of what they're reporting and what they're driving. That someone has to bridge that gap. And part of what you know, what Chris was referring to in terms of speaking the language or the common language or what I call speaking the language of the C-suite in terms of what is that you have to put those numbers together. You have to be uh, many things, uh, 
I, I say in this research report on the change, manage, uh, change agents manifesto is that you have to be not just a politician, but also uh, a lawyer uh, and also a, a data storyteller and that you have to bring all of these different things together that show what someone needs to hear and how they need to hear it tied together with numbers, tied together with evidence, tied together with possible outcomes and potential outcomes so that everybody involved can, can believe in, in, in your work. And, and Chris, I'll, I'll let you finish sort of that and what you're, you're measuring. Yeah, it's interesting. So I've, here's, here's a, I don't, know, I don't know for all of us to do development, but here's a controversial statement. I think it is absolutely pointless measuring ROI below the portfolio level for a given line of business. And I, I sometimes have some very spirited discussions with our finance team around this. And the reason is, you've got all these projects, they're feeding into the overall um, experience the consumer gets, and then the consumer is, especially in our business, has got a subscription they're holding because of that. So when, you, when, when somebody comes to me and says, well, we need to know exactly what it costs, and why do you need to know what it costs? With, you know what the portfolio costs. They're like, well, so we can plan ROI. Like, how on earth do you know what the return is? There is no way to unentangle these variables. That is impossible. It's mathematically impossible. We don't have that precision. And so I think one of the problems is when people start measuring ROI, measure it at an appropriate level. So the level I think is appropriate is here's what we invest in a business and here's what that business returns. If you start looking at features and you start looking at product extensions, all these other things and saying, well, we need an ROI, I think you're kind of missing the point in the modern world. I think you need to look at total investment, total return. And that clears up kind of actually a lot of the mess if you can convince people of that. Um, because, you know, I find that a lot of organizations love to, would actually much prefer to be precisely incorrect than generally right. Um, because it gives them this sense of, well, they must be on it because they've got all these detailed numbers. Well, the detailed numbers are a fiction. We don't really know how the customer will receive it. I mean, how many, how many of us have really seen ROI projections that really pan out? Now, large cap, cap scale investment and, and capital investment, that's a different matter. You can actually plan that. But when it comes to consumer-based products, I just don't think, other than like a line of business, you can really plan it. So first one is, don't get, if you can't, don't get caught in the game of ROI for small things. We talk about portfolio ROI. Um, and then what we measure, it really depends. I mean, you've got your vanity stats because you kind of want to know your population and what your monthly actives are and your unique users. Um, and then you have, but beyond that, you have to measure one what you think is really important. So if you're in a moment of truth, you need to measure success across a moment of truth. Maybe you need to measure net promoter score one side and the other. Um, that means you have to run experiments, take people through a new experience and measure what their net promoter score was at the end versus um, the net promoter score of people on the old path. And we have this idea of relationship net promoter score, so RNPS, which is the long term how you feel, and then TNPS, which is through a transaction, how did you feel? And then other than that, it's, you've got to come back to the product teams and it's like any good data science. KPIs are no different. What question do you need to answer? You have to think about the questions you need to answer and then plan for the data to answer those questions. And so, you know, from a development perspective, it's great to put the infrastructure in to be able to say, hey, I want real-time stats, I want batch stats, I've got these different things that I want to get back from application to make it very easy for developers to instrument. So as product comes in and says, could you find these three things out for me? They're like, yeah, that's easy. I can just go and add that. But beyond that, it really depends what you're trying to answer for that question. So if you've got a funnel problem with, hey, how do I track from when somebody downloads an application, how many people go through and they set up an account and they watch their first video, go to their second video. That's very different than saying, I want to understand the heat map of how somebody moves through our user experience. So it really is, you know, we'd say in England, horses for courses, but it really is about understand the question, design your data feeds and your data analysis for the answer. Let's actually talk tech for a moment since you brought up data, which is such an interesting topic. Uh, so, so maybe, uh, and Brian, jump in as well. How how can organizations use data in the service of customer experience, in the service of digital transformation? Where do you get that data? And how does Comcast, how do you think about data? I know you've, you've been just been talking about that a little bit. Well, we, we have huge amounts of data across everything, whether it's our products. You can only vaguely imagine how much data our network produces. Um, we're using it in many ways. We use it for operationally to act, you know, to, to keep the service running, to give consumers a great service. Um, but we also use it, as I said, to answer product questions, to understand where we should go next in our products. And more and more, we, we have a very strong machine learning 
uh, artificial intelligence and deep learning um, set of core teams here. And so we're using that data to not only sort of find out new insights to be able to recognize in our products, we're using that data to actually create new product experiences that you can only create with those intelligent methods. Um, and then the same with operations, feeding data in and looking for that sort of pattern matching recognition and next action recommendation that you can only do by using you know, very deep networks um, to be able to recognize all this data coming in. So we're starting to use data as a way to actually change how we operate and as a core of how we build and the functionality our products um, deliver. And I think that's going to become common to many companies. You'll start, data will become part of the product. And I think what we're finding is, you know, the algorithms that are available are becoming commodity. You can get great data algorithms everywhere. Um, the, the actual technology frameworks whether it's MXNet, whether it's TensorFlow, like analysis and modeling frameworks are becoming commodity. The real thing you have as a company is your data. The models you build with that data, that is your secret source, that is your gold. So we're very focused on how do we use our data effectively and it's more of a question of like capacity. We have infinite amounts of great questions and things we can do and it's just sequencing them through product development, through product insights, through network operations, um, to be able, and your know, customer experience, to be able to uh, get the most valuable things done first. And so, you know, I think we all used to talk about big data, now we're all talking about AI, machine learning, but all of that, it's just remember, they're just tools. You know, without great people thinking great ideas, without being able to actually develop it, without actually being able to take the insights, all the data, and have the actuation loop to really affect things, there's no point collecting it. I mean, I used to joke that what would happen is, You'd have in the big data world, you'd have a board of directors that said, "We need, we need data," and uh, dutifully the company would go off and gather like huge amounts of data, and then they would say, "Well, we're not, nothing's happening," and so they go, "Ah, we need more data." So you get even bigger data, and then you realize a little bit later you've got no insights from it, so you start building the insight engine, and you got this like huge first bit, and then it narrows to insights, and then still nothing happens, and everybody's scratching their heads, and then you realize actuation. There was no pathway to take the the results we had and actually change the world based on that. So you kind of want it to look more like a pipe where your insights match, your analysis match, your ability to, to actuate. And the, and the last point I'll say on that is the trouble is lots of people are very opinionated and they're used to in the old world saying just, well, this is my opinion and so let's go do it. And then and you say, well, we're going to become a data-driven organization. And what they really mean is I'm going to be a data-driven organization unless I disagree with the data. And then suddenly I'm going to challenge the data, not my thinking. And so there is a cultural element where you really need to start being able to check your ego and say, wow, I'm surprised. I had an insight. My insight was wrong, but I've got a new insight. Let's go, deal, uh, you know, let's go drive that. So if you can get those to line up, you can actually start making change in the org. And Brian Solis, uh, as you look across many organizations, this role of data, what are, you, what are you seeing? What do you suggest? I love this notion of data being the key because algorithms are a commodity. It's one of the reasons why I'm uh, vice president of the Chris Satchel fan club. I think uh, <laughs> I, re I report to his wife, who's the president of the fan club, but the, uh, you know, he nailed it right. I mean, he's been nailing everything, but right there at the end, it's it's the biggest challenge I've seen data uh, meet. And this is across the board in any conversation is that, remember, the challenges for any of this is are, are human. And really what you have is that you're working against a career long of experiences that, uh, you know, that are behind every executive or behind every decision maker that you're working with and that they got to that role of where they are because they've made great decisions along the way. And, that, and those decisions have fortified their experiences and have validated their beliefs and their perspectives. And so what you're really trying to do is challenge convention. Uh, and this is where it gets very difficult because data only reinforces what you want to see uh, or what you expect to see. Uh, and so you have to, this is one of the reasons why I say being a data storyteller and having common language is that you have to be able to get data to tell the story of what is actually happening based on an assumption that is going to challenge the convention. Uh, and this is the art of it. Uh, and this is where it gets very difficult because what you're essentially doing is trying to apply a Jedi mind trick to someone who doesn't want to be wrong in a way that you get them to feel that they're part of the solution and that in some way, shape or form that they're validated in this direction. Cause it's very difficult to get someone to say, I mean, just apply this to any conversation about politics on Facebook today. It's very different to say, 
this is what I think. And this is what someone else is thinking that they'll come back and say, wow, you've completely changed my mind. Thank you for that. I mean, that just, <laughs> <laughs> just never happens. Uh, the other thing too, is that the story is bigger than I think anyone's really able to comprehend. And what Chris mentioned earlier and what I'd love to kind of go back to at some point is that NPS is one of those things that validates a s part of the story and can validate the old story or can validate the new story. And Chris has used moments of truth, which is uh, something I'm a big believer in, in that the entire, if you, if you look at the proper definition of customer experience or employee experience for that matter, it is the sum of all engagements someone has with your organization throughout the entire journey and throughout the life cycle. So it's not just about any one moment, it's about how all those moments come together. And what I try to use data for, and also metrics coming back to that point, is something that I've learned from a good friend of mine named Thomas Marzano at Philips, where you've created an, essentially an experience flow, where you've taken all of those key moments of truth, and you've designed what those experiences should be, how they parlay into every bit of it. And it doesn't just play out into a flow, it also plays out into what's the messaging, what's the packaging, what's the support infrastructure look like, what's the policies look like. And you're building out this whole thing where NPS or whatever metrics you wanna use, as, as Chris mentioned, you look transactionally and also overall, you're now starting to measure for what I call experience architecture. What is the experience that someone is supposed to have? That is the design. We're not talking about a brand style guide. We're not talking about corporate vision or mission. We are talking about a human emotion and we'll measure those emotions by the reactions that they have and what happens next. And essentially what I feel is ironic but also beautiful at the same time is that AI and machine learning and deep learning are allowing us to humanize all of these aspects, leaning on technology to actually humanize these experiences that someone has to say, this is the standard of which we want to deliver and now let's design for that. And I, I, I have two questions that I want to kind of flop back over to Chris. One is, how did you get to what is essentially becoming an experience flow and how did you get people to see that? And then the second part is how did you get to this agile like organization in that, you know, what we're listening to is I, I document digital transformation in six stages and your, you know, Comcast is up there uh, at, the, at the top of the stages, but you had to get there from a, a point that was before your time that was nowhere close to, to the fourth, fifth or sixth stage. And I think people would want to hear two, two things about experience flow, which I think is part of the story of how you got people to the table. And then secondly, how you got executives to support an agile infrastructure. Well, I think with the experience flow side is, you know, it's some of it I think we got to, and I got to personally from kind of just hard lessons. You know, when you, when you think about, and I can go back a couple of companies and I can think about this, here, here's, my, here's what sort of threw me into experience flow. You, you build a next generation of your app, your next release, and it's great, it's better than the current one. And you put it in the app store and the ratings go way down. You're like, that's odd, like we really tested it, we thought it was great, and then you go read the comments, and you realize the comments are all about your up, they're really rating your upgrade cycle or your upgrade path, not the actual app once you're in there. And so, you know, it's comments like, oh, it made me log in again. Oh, it nuked my preferences. Oh, I've, I have to reattach something or re-log into another service. And what, this, what they're really saying is, you thought too narrowly about what the application was. You thought the experience was just, well, when everything's good, now I iterate through and I get to do something. It's like, no, you have to think about, what is it like when you upgrade? What is it like when you acquire that application? How do you get into it? How do you learn about the application first? Why do you even pick the application? And as you start, as you've got those hard lessons, you start sort of spanning out from the core experience in each direction. And you say, well, there's a, hang on, the world's bigger than I thought. And if every touch point is giving an impression of our brand and of our services, oh dear, because I've not been managing, you know, two thirds of it. So, one of the messages that we give to product managers is you have to think all the way from the beginning, right? Think about even when the person doesn't even know they have a need for it, how are you going to tell them about that? To, well, how do they actually discontinue the relationship with that application? And how would they go and be a promoter? Can the app help them do that? Um, and it means you've got to measure in the field. You know, your job as a product manager does not finish when the thing is released. Then you start actively measuring what's happening in the field and you've got to react to that both your new ideas you had for the next version, 
plus this. So you have to, in the way you do it, you have to start mapping out all the points in a, an experience journey. And sure, if you imagine this on a, on a piece of paper, that probably the engagement bit, once you've gone through acquisition and you've um, set up and you're ready to go, it's probably got the most flows within it, but you kind of have to think about how, how they work together. How would they recommend this to somebody else? How do you get them re-engaged? Or if they do want to leave, how do you have a nice clean exit relationship? And I think that should be great as well. There's no point making it difficult for somebody. That just kind of annoys them. It's like, hey, you've decided to leave because you maybe you don't like something or maybe it's not useful. So on the way out, we're going to kick you a bit because we think that will make you a promoter afterwards. Like it's, hey, if we just keep kicking you, you'll stay. It's, it's a silly way to think about how people engage. So one is you just have to start in the middle and think broad. You just have to tell your product manager, tell your developers, keep thinking broadly and keep asking the question, well, what would happen then? Um, what happens if I don't have this? And, it's, and you know, there's that, um, I wish I could remember who to attribute this to. Brian, you might remember, but it's that, you know, show me how much you care about your edge cases and I'll show you how much you care about your customer. And that is one of the kind of little insidious things about MVP. People took MVP to mean, well, I'm just going to do my core experience and I won't worry about all the edge cases. I think that's, that term like, should have died about seven years ago because now consumers do not have the time or patience. So if you're not thinking about that journey, if you're not thinking about edge cases, you've got kind of what, a minute now, maybe two, to convince people to keep using your application. So if, if you haven't thought about your onboard journey, and I, I'm, you'll see app developers really do this well now, but if you're not thought about it, if you're not thinking about how you get in and how you have an effective first couple of minutes that are orchestrated to make it great, how do you go on to your next experience, you're going to lose people. So you can't just have an MVP anymore. We like to talk about having MLPs, like minimal lovable product. Um, and on the agile side, I mean, you know, let's give my boss, Tony Warner, a lot of credit. He really took Comcast from being an aggregator and integrator to a, a full technology shop. Um, our ex-CTO, Shrikant, he did a great job of championing agile. And then I think the more people you bring in, and as we've brought people in from all other industries, as we keep hiring from great universities, people just expect that Agile is the way you're going to work. And for us, we have to have continuous delivery. We have to have very rapid release. Um, there's no other way. Our, our products are too big to try and have like monolithic releases or waterfall. You have to allow sprint teams to release independently, maybe into a vehicle, same vehicle, but they have to be able to release their code individually. Um, and that, that just becomes really important for velocity. And I think we think a lot about velocity. And I'll give you an example. We've got a program called RDK and it is the firmware for all of our devices. We open source it. There's about 700 companies that, that are on board um, using it. And one of the reasons we do it, the main reason is we can, we can change our firmware, and we do change our firmware and our hardware every two weeks. Now, we do multiple releases in between. We'll take them to 5%. We'll check what they're, if they're solving the problems we thought or adding the functionality correctly. But every two weeks, we're rolling a full firmware release across our hardware footprint. We can't do that unless we have agile teams and we control that, that code. So everything we do is set up for these teams to be able to deliver quickly. And I think one of the nice things about Comcast is we, we had an executive team and, you know, and Brian and Neil Smith when he was the CEO, now Dave is the CEO, and Tony that believed in us and said, well, if, as long as you keep producing great results, we don't really mind how you organize development. So we've just, we're constantly tweaking it to make it great for our staff and make them productive. And we just say, focus on the results. Look how fast we can get things out. Look how much we're producing. Look at the quality. Don't focus on our development methods. Just let us worry about that in development. Fantastic. You know, we are past time. We are out of time. We are done. And this has gone by so quickly. But as we, as we go to the end, Brian, you're going to have the last word. But quick, quick, quick. And then Chris, we were, you know, another alternative is we could just like maybe do this for another hour or two. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, you got the last word very quickly, though. Very quick. Chris, so I'm just going to turn this to you for a quick, quick, quick answer. Uh, and that is I talk often about the difference between iteration and innovation. Many companies think they're being innovative, but they're actually being iterative, which I describe as doing the same thing, but better, whereas innovation is doing new things that create new value. And I look at the Comcast or the Xfinity remote as sort of this metaphor for the, the two. Buttons are iterative, you know, backlit keys, dedicated buttons, and then the voice, the whole infrastructure for voice was innovative. How did you get the company to see the difference between the two? And Chris, really quick, because we're, we're, we're out of time. We're past time. It's a continuum. 
So I think it, small iteration is just micro innovation. You need innovation that's small, you need innovation that's medium, where you're extending products, and you need innovation that's doing completely new things, and you have people dedicated across that time continuum. All right, that was quick. Uh, really, this this has been a fast conversation. I sure wish we had more time. Uh, Chris Satchel, your executive vice president and chief product officer at Comcast. I hope you'll come back and do this again another time. Would love to. And Brian Solis, you are one of the top researchers on change and digital transformation in the world. We're honored that you are back again, and I hope you will come back and do this another time as well. Yeah, absolutely. And dear audience members, we hope you will definitely come back next week on CXO Talk. Next Friday, we are speaking with Michael Chewy, who runs McKinsey Global Institute. That's the research arm of McKinsey. And when he does research on the future and he does research on artificial intelligence, man, he's a guy to listen to. Everybody, thanks so much for watching CXO Talk. Uh, come back soon. Be sure to like us on Facebook. Don't forget that. See you later, everybody. Bye-bye.